And we're on. Can everyone get a hand? Hello. Anita. Professor Baldwin. You too. <laughs> Mother. Um, we are talking about, um, to, it's last, second and last week of, of this summer class, uh, interpreting visual culture. We're using this ocean of visual culture to actually parse things out, to talk about software, talk about a critical approach. But one of my methods to my madness is that I want you not just to see me as a gatekeeper saying, oh, the kids, this is what reality is. That's, that's nowhere nowadays. I want you to go find out what reality is by asking for money, right? To go to the, the, knock on the door and say, I'm doing a documentary film, please give me 5,000 bucks. And the, these donors could say, oh, kid, go play on the street or get, get the hell out of my way or some rougher language. But, studio audience, we actually had um, a favorable, who, who got a response back from your bit? Like all of you. Um, well, first of all, why, and Anita sent out and actually got to step two, right? Which is, what did the donor say? So the donor, um, he seemed to be really interested in the project, and he just wants to know the fact that when I sent it out, I didn't realize that it was out in Texas. So he wants me to con like continue talking back and forth with him if there's a possibility to do something there, from what I understood from the email. So okay. I want to need to like clarify in terms of what that means. So we're asking for public money to do um, aesthetic, artistic, cultural, R&D, um, public projects. Alicia, what is that? Public projects? Yeah. Is this, we're asking for free money to, is it, why is this like or not like a bank loan? It's not like a bank loan only because it's what people want to get involved in because they figure in the future it'll bring them more of an investment. Or, they, they, or they think the corporation, it's a very simple thing. You ever hear of tax write-offs? Okay, companies, gigantic companies like Microsoft, Bill and Melinda Gates, he actually sold off most of his company, or all of his company, and instead of taking all this money and buying yachts and seeing fast women and all of that stuff, he decided to take about 80% of that and turn it into an NGO. Now that is public money. He just gave a couple million for each of his kids, and you know, it was very interesting how this happened. But corporations, like any of the buildings you see here in New York, um, they have to give a certain percentage of their tax money to NGOs to make a corporate write-off. So actually, in a good Wall Street year, as, as the, the country is printing money furiously, <laughs> it could mean bode well for NGO hunting and gathering at the end of the fiscal year. Everyone gets that? They need tax write-offs. They give to people like you, but instead of giving to people like you, they give to NGO, NFP, not-for-profit, non-governmental office, for public projects. Now, these could even be in terms of small business development. So if you have an idea for small business that has a cultural aspect to it or just needs incubation, you could do that too. Um, so what, Joseph, do, do we, do you, can you sell this thing at the end of making it? You mean the grant? The, no, the content. Well, it is, you did for a grant, so it's kind of like shared property. It's not like... Yeah, it's the public property. That's why Getty Images, when they went back to these public archives, when in the 30s and 40s, the WPA was paying all these photographers to shoot photos of the depression of people, whatever. They went and bought these images, which were already paid for by the taxpayer. So it was very, it was kind of, a, I don't know if any lawyer pursued him on this, but this, those were archives from our public past, paid for by our ancestors, probably not yours, but the, our public ancestors' money, right? Okay, let's, let's continue with this. Why would I think... Um, Anita, this has something to do with the real out there, as opposed to the 
the entity which you're paying money to go to Stony Brook University. I feel the fact that you taught, you're you teaching us right now that yes, you are telling about all of these great opportunities and things that we can do, and what I like about your approach is that you are, you're telling us to kind of go out there and see for ourselves and actually try, and like you said, hit that send button and see what can actually make of it. So surprisingly, I didn't think I'd get a response at all, and you when did. I when I saw the response, I was like, I didn't care what it said, I was just happy that it was a response. So it's just definitely something that, you know, uh, when you put things into action, you see results, whether they may be in your favor or not in your favor. So I feel like it's really important for us, especially, um, I don't know, in the school, like to kind of do things and go out there and experience these things. If we don't do now, like, when will we get the chance to do it? I, I personally, I do because I'm a professor and come from a, a family of professors, whatever. I think the current educational system's in a crisis because people are paying too much, waiting too long, kept out of job markets, you know, too long, and you're told, just wait, just wait, just wait. You know, to, it's just to keep the older people in the markets so you get old enough to get into the market to pay their pensions. I mean, it's like in some ways, and I'm a good left winger, but I I think this this whole bubble scheme of society is 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 like a cancer, it's eroding. So this is one of my concepts of saying don't don't take my pedagogy. I don't want to give you good, you know, pseudo liberal pedagogy. It's develop your own way of criticizing society. One of which is be to ask for this money. Now, when you heard back from them. What, and everyone did hear back, right? What did you hear, Joseph? I heard mean, back in two. One said that they already finished their process. The other one said they referred me to a different website where they said I should go and look for it. Can anyone guess what would happen if they didn't reply back? Their, their jobs might be in jeopardy. Their, their boss might go, hey, you got these in your inbox and you didn't address them or send back a courteous letter to whatever? Just, See what I mean? I just thought like, they might have a lot. In what general, I mean? well, p figure this. In general, these people could be even taken from taxpayers' money themselves. So they're on the hot seat, too. So you start to see, I want people to start even understanding what the public has become in today's society a lot of you are first generation Americans. We're now Americans now. What, is, what does it mean publicly to be American? How are your parents paying taxes and how, what is actually your right to, to take from society? You get a leveraged, economically a leveraged education if you've been living in New York State, correct? From Stony Brook, right, Jonathan? So... It's at half what someone from out state would pay. Is anyone from out state? No one. So you're all paying half of what you would. Um, nowadays, there are people running around Stony Brook who are from out of state. Yes, yeah, so they pay. Uh, a lot they pay twice. Twice what you guys are paying. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And it's because you guys are great. Your parents are great taxpayers within New York State. So that's part of the, the, the cost. I'm trying to get, have you guys look at a cosmology. Anita, tell, that's cool. So you send your boomerang out there into the dark reality. It comes floating back. You catch it. What's your next step and what do you feel? So I'm like, I want to contact him back and like figure out what exactly he want, means by me. Like, do I have to actually be in Texas or does that, can I just send him? Uh, you know, because I know we talked about it and I, in my grant proposal, I focus more on very like specific things. And then when you told me to kind of do it at more of a universal <coughs> look at it, like uh, how this uh, small culture has survived so many years and how... Oh, I, w I want you to explain that because uh, Anita's grant, YouTube audience, involves... It's interesting because we expand this notion of the public. First of all, there I said last time there's there's more CO2 in the atmosphere than, than in three million years. Okay, whose problem is that? That's our problem. It's not like, you know, Uzbekistan's problem. It's like the entire globe. Now, Anita is doing a project that is locally based. You look for funding within America, but it's actually international in scope, yes. right? 
give the YouTube audience just a couple bullet points of the project. So basically, uh, my family's from Uzbekistan, and I think what's really cool about my culture is that, yes, we are Jewish. It's from part of the former Soviet Union, so it's been like, it's a lot of, um, a lot of different cultural fusions are diffused into my big culture, and though we are very small, there's a small percentage of us in Queens, New York, and then Tel Aviv, Israel. So that's pretty the main two main areas uh, where you'll find us. And the thing is, I first focused on my grand proposal of just writing about how where we came about and what was how that came about and like the persecution, this and that. But I felt like when I spoke to you after that, yes, like I feel like all the Jew different types of Jewish people went through that. But then when you told me. How did my culture survive so many years? Let, let's add one thing for the history buffs, too. It's your family's from this ancient, dynamic city of Samarkand. Yes. Which is an important city connecting Honestly. east and west. When China was at its height, and the west <laughs> was just an armpit of Asia, you know, the, the west was no nothing. This road was vitally important for transmitting silk, uh, luxury items, non like luxury items, yes. and Samarkand plus the Jewish community that moved really long ago, like 500 AD or something, mm -hmm. like 1000 AD, uh, if I remember, moved to Samarkand, and so this city actually represents globalism back then. Yes. And today we're, this is the universality I wanted to point out, and today we're re-encountering a type of globalistic spirit. I thought your project could address the larger issues of globalism as it's reconfigured both then, 580 or 1080, way up to our times now. Especially since China is ascending economically, culturally, India is too, and that we no longer can view like Western modernity as like hegemonic or like the value system, that we have a melting of value systems. What you also work for an agency within New York City. Yes, it's called Jewish Crossroads Associations and there, I work in a small branch of it. Uh, it's called the Bukhari and Lunch. So the purpose of it is to um, help families and children within this community, whether it be applying to colleges, get, getting good grades in high school, um, learning how to be leaders, we have a leadership board, um, how to basically progress in such, uh, in America, when you come from such a small, uh, you know, country such as Uzbekistan. Tiny you community know. within the larger community, which, which opens up, as I said, YouTube community, with um, this, uh, this whole concept of the, the, the issue of being an American is how how do we be diverse and unified? Exactly. And you that's know. one of the biggest like, things that we try to do is, yes, our, a lot of our stuff is, yes, we're in America, we do like things like Americans do, but we're trying to also um, teach the teens that come us our culture, how our language evolved, why are we called Baharians uh, for, some, for that reason, and just basically have our culture and have them be proud of it rather than uh, pushing it down and just... Becoming like so it's interesting, you're asking for public money from maybe even Texas mm -hmm. to help preserve identity in order to become universal. I want to focus on Joseph's. Joseph is of Indian descent, but of Catholic Indian descent from very, very ancient Christians who settled on the east, the west coast of India, right? That's the mythology, yeah. That's the mythology. Yeah. What's, what's the reality? I don't know what the reality is. So mythology is reality yeah, yeah. at this point. Yeah. So a little similar here. Yeah. It's like because you're coming from, they were coming from a largely Hindu country, Hindu and Muslim. Catholics represent a small fraction of the population. Yeah, like, but the state that I'm in, like uh, Christians represent like 20 to 30 percent of the population. Is it below Mumbai? Is it? Um, you mean in terms of the number of Christians? No, where, where is it located? Is oh, it's south like of Goa? Southernmost part of India, right next to Sri Lanka and Tamil Nadu. And north it's coastal, north, right? Yeah, north of it would be like uh, Bangalore. What, what, are, what, is, what are your ethnicity? What's what specific name for it? Uh, Malayali. 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 Yeah. 
And most of them became Catholics? No, like, um, I would say most are like Hindus, but not a majority. After that, it would be Muslims, and then it would be Christians. Okay. So, wh what kind of universal appeal do you see in Anita's project? For you to ask for the same, you're asking a public entity, like, you could even ask Bill and Melinda Gates, this, oh, I need some education on this notion of migration, identity, and religion. Please give me 5,000 bucks to make a film. Okay. What's your hook? Um, how people of various different religions have lived more or less in peace, despite the large numbers of diversity in terms of religious diversity in my part of India. Cool, because you, you've got Hindus, Muslims, Christians, mm -hmm. and India has been the font of many religions. Yeah. You've got Buddhists, you have, yeah. what else? Well, a Sikhs? Of, not a lot of Buddhists now, but... Past there were, There's yeah. m many important Buddhist temples in this yeah, south. A lot of right? Buddhists were wiped out in India. But, yeah, like, by whom? By the Hindus. Oh. That, and that happened so long ago, no one really remembers it. But that's what happened. So there have been religious wars in India that. Wars. Yeah, like people like forced to switch religion and all that stuff. But Jains and Sikhs and, and a couple other. There, for most Europeans who aren't history buffs, you don't know that there's three or four other religions in India that are that are as old as, as say, Jainism or... or yeah, I feel like uh, Buddhism was older in India than Hinduism. Hinduism is relatively new, but it kind of took over everything and like, wiped out the rest. But, well, as they like, say, Brahmanism, right? Yeah, then, like, Islam came in. Also, in... Made, in the Mughals. Yeah. The Mughals. Made part of India and like, they kind of became part of India, too. But. How is open to all of you, Chinese-Americans... Italo-Americans, how important, you of course, this is an incredible history story and I want you to put this in our little installation on the High Line, um, in terms of our little triggers, um, Caribbean Americans, how important is it to educate future generation in a diaspora, this idea of leaving your home country? Jonathan. How important will it be for your kids, your grandkids, to realize they're still Chinese American? Or will you tell them they're American? Well, it's also your Chinese American. Because their culture is still Chinese, but we live here, so it'll be a mix of both. Because you can't really abandon one once it's there. So I guess either way, it's also be Chinese. But then doesn't it seem that sometimes, yes, like, or by the time your grandchildren, like I feel, but on my grandchildren, there are certain like traditions and cultural customs, like within my, I feel like it's gonna die out because like not a lot of people either, you know. Just like languages very, like, die out every exactly, year, right? Exactly. Whole languages die out every. Something like six languages mm -hmm. die out a year. I heard something become oh, extinct. It's it's like alone in in New Guinea. There's something like uh, what used to be 200 separate different languages, and because it's a jungle island or whatever, now those things whittle down every year. Um, English Americanism. How do you feel Americanisms have affected your Italian side or the other? Or you said also Irish American. Yeah. And you might even be partial Native American, right? Okay. How do you? In America, are we going toward a vanishing point, a perspectival vanishing point, to become American? Apple pie, Chevrolets, cheerleaders, football games. I think it. I think it <laughs> also so yeah, um, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with the generation, the if you lose your customs, each generation is going to become more Americanized. How many watch Super Bowl? And enjoy it. You watch it, but you don't enjoy it. I watch it for the food. Oh, That's for the good. I watch it for the commercials sometimes. Oh, and the commercials. And the Those are great. Football, whatever. Uh, how many uh, shoot off fireworks on Fourth of July? Italians are way behind that. <laughs> <laughs> Famous for it. How many shoot off fireworks on Chinese New Year? Like firecrackers. Firecrackers. Uh, what else? How many? How many do even even Jewish people? How many kind of nominally celebrate Christmas? 
Morella, have a tree. Something you have a tree? Like, yes, I oh. have a tree, but it's a different Your parents reason know or don't know? Yes, they know that I have a tree because we were part of the former Soviet Union, so ah. we don't celebrate on Christmas and it, we don't exchange gifts on Christmas. We do it on New Year's Eve, like when the ball drops, ah. we have a tree. We have and a everyone knows that's and German, right? And it's probably pagan. It's not even Christian. It's probably like Druidic, ancient Celtic, get a tree represents fertility, all that. So we have a, a syncretic tradition. We're going to wrap up at 20. Give, give Anita a hand. <laughs>